Brilliant. So welcome everyone to um, the Natural Cambridgeshire Partnership Forum. We have a really exciting um, range of speakers about um, species, both in general and in specific, and um, reintroducing as well as kind of encouraging um, current species um, in Cambridgeshire. So I'm Pamela Abbott. I'm the director of the Natural, uh, Natural Cambridgeshire, and we are brilliantly supported here by Helen Dye, our coordinator, who will be um, fixing any of the tech and, and making sure the slides work. If you have questions for the speaker, do put them in the chat and we'll be picking them up. Um, and do make sure that while the talks are going and unless you are, have been uh, invited to give a question that your um, screen is on, your computer is on mute. Um, so we're going to take questions after Kevin's and then we're going to um, group some of them later in a kind of logical fashion. So we have speaker, speaker and then some questions. So first of all, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Kevin Hand, uh, well known to very many of us, a uh, conservationist with a passion for birds and mammals and ecotourism, which I understand he's doing at the moment. Um, he's led Darwin initiatives on the Tega forest in Siberia and looking at sustainable forest use in Ecuadorian Amazon. And he's president of the uh, Cambridge Natural History Society. And today he's going to speak to us about iconic species of Cambridge. Thank you, Kevin. So, coming through all right? Uh, this is where okay, so. <laughs> I'm, I've loaded them. Hang on, let's see what's happening. So, uh, let me try again, see if I can. Are you all right? Uh, this worked earlier, bear with. Worked well earlier. I've, so this all came to a conversation with Helen. At, and I spoke about um, what I've done in. Can you hear me OK now? You're breaking up a bit. Kevin. Response. So, yeah. I do apologize for this. I'm trying to move around the room a bit and see if I can increase the bandwidth. It doesn't seem to be helping much. That's You're, coming through. You're coming through well now. Okay, great, great. Well, fingers crossed. Um, so yeah, work I did on Alb in Albania. So I run wildlife holidays for the um, the people at Stapleford Granary, the, the ACE uh, Foundation, Association for Cultural Exchange. And when I set up a new tour, I try to work with local conservation groups um, and there's a, a wonderful group in Albania called PPNEA. Uh, and we talked about focusing on Egyptian vulture, which is what this image shows. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what does that, what did that mean? We wanted to uh, not so much just protect Egyptian vulture, but we wanted to use it as a flagship species for wildlife in the country both to get our people of Albania excited about their wildlife and their habitats and people from outside Albania thinking this was a good country to visit. It has great wildlife, not necessarily the negative perceptions of Albania. So we did a whole lot of publicity. We did TV interviews. Uh, we did Egyptian vulture talks and conferences. We worked with schools. Um, it was a few of us from the UK, mainly um, young Albanian people and, and PPNEA staff and volunteers. Uh, we set up an art project which exchanged paintings of Egyptian vulture for bars where they had stuffed, stuffed Egyptian vultures. So that was a nice positive thing. And we set up surveys, nest monitoring and things of that sort. But it was very much about Egyptian vulture and all of the wildlife. And this is the idea of a flagship species. Next slide, please. Um, so part of the artwork in included the largest mural in the Balkans painted on the wall of this tower block, which shows Egyptian vulture uh, and cuckoo. That there's a lovely story about how the two species work together on migration, supporting each other, which I won't go into now, but. Uh, if there's time later, maybe. So next slide, please. Okay. 
bear with. Yeah, no, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I'm just sticking. I'm still here. There we go. Yeah, good. So could we use iconic species in Cambridgeshire? Pretty different. Sorry for the spelling mistake there. Pretty different location to Albania. Yeah. But it's not just Albania. It, you know, the, the flagship species are used in a variety of places. So the next uh, sentence. So yes, I think yes. And I know that it's ship's been discussing. Um, if it gets more of the public involved in interested in nature. Next sentence. This is the key question. What species? So one thing is to think about what aspect of life do we want to focus on? Um, and it may be that uh, uh, we have. Is this coming to okay? You're breaking um, up. Breaking up a bit. Uh, okay. Uh, anyway, if you've gone, if you'd like to go on to the next slide, the slides mostly expels. Even if you can't hear me, I think. So what habitat would we like to focus on? Cambridge is known for its wetlands, the the uses and and river networks, so that could be something. And I know that Harold Godwit has been oh, Kevin, we've lost you. Uh, and Wetlands Trust, but probably not the ideal species for what we're. we're it's a, it's a beautiful bird. It's not going to be seen by that many people. So, um, Helen. Well, the thing that most people would recognize, uh, fairly easy to actually see, and uh, typical of the habitat you wish to highlight. And I Okay, next, please. Guess what species you might have come up with? See what's going to come up next? Hey, fishes. Everybody knows kingfishers, pretty much everybody apart from Angus like kingfishers. They're uh, easily recognizable, to see, but not impossible. And they symbolize not just wetlands, but also the wonderful river that run through our county. Next slide, please. How might we use, if we went for Kingfisher, for example, how, how might, how would it work? conjunction with the BTO or RSPB or others, um, which would give us new records. Science as an increased interest in our habit and wetlands for a day to picnic beside a river with use of looking for kingfishers uh, they may or may not see them, but hopefully they would learn and have a pleasant time. River ecology, and if if kingfishers were seen, that's next, please. Kevin, we've lost you again. Recognised, I think. Um, relatively uh, common during the season uh, on a number of wetland systems and a beautiful thing to, to look for. Uh, British Dragonfly Society with its links at Wiccan and elsewhere could be a useful partner there. Next slide, please. Thank you. Could be plants. Um, 
yellow water lily I, I thought the bill pretty well it, it occurs in a variety of rivers and lakes and is pretty recognizable again in season plant life in 2002 uh, gave every county in britain uh, a um I, uh, ship and they chose flower for cambridgeshire It occurred to me if you went for uh, insects, flowers, butterflies, you could people try and collect the whole set, see who could find Kingfisher, uh, Yellow to Lily, and Banded Demoiselle in the same day, same week, or, or whatever. Next slide. This final slide, I think. And apologies again for the bandwidth. Uh, so, some of the issues to think about. It worked. General, aware, be aware of factors outside our control. Uh, so, if it may not be as a result of the project that, that you're working on. So, in Sussex, the uh, plant life suggested the round headed rampion, which some of you may know is a very rare plant and is declining a lot. So, that's a rather negative message, perhaps, for the, uh, the downland grasslands that it was suggested that, that they would, uh, the round headed rampion would champion. Uh, and most people now know round-headed rampion as the name of the large wind turbine project in the English Channel off the, the Sussex coast. There's a slightly curious connotation there. If someone borrows your species name for some other project. Um, be aware of seasonality, as we said, it may not be visible all the time, so make that clear. Uh, any other factors affecting when you see it, when you don't see it? Uh, in your activities, you suggest pose no threat. So for things like Kingfisher, you'd want to be sure people didn't try and uh, photograph them and get close to them, uh, particularly when Nessies, as we, as we said, if it declines. And a, a key question, what would you put into, with limited resources, this uh this facet of of the partnerships work um it could be really could touch a whole range of more complex conservation messages it can shorthand for uh, so it can be useful so maybe others can do a lot of work um, so hopefully that's useful. Brilliant. Thank you um, very much. And obviously <laughs> very happy to take questions. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thanks. And thank you, thank you for soldiering on through your uh, bandwidth issues and thank you everyone else for um bearing with us as we um as we worked our way through that. I've seen that Richard in the chat has put um, a proposal um, in relation okay. to for um, uh, East Cambridgeshire. And I wondered if anyone had any questions um, for Kevin, do use the reactions raise hand or put it in the... Right, I mean, the key question is what species you protect, you, you go for. And it's quite hard to choose, isn't it? And I think probably you need a small committee selection, um, depending on what it is you want to achieve. You could have a competition of some sort, which uh, uh, certainly has value, doesn't it? Gets people interested. So that could be really a really good thing. Yeah. yeah just, just to explain, if I can jump in on what I put in the chat though, very similar theme to what you're talking about, but the way we've approached it is to come up with not necessarily an iconic or rare species, but a fairly common, lovable species that the public can really get behind and enjoy, like hedgehogs or whatever, that need support, but do it via a public vote. So that it, it's about engaging people in the concept of helping animals, protecting animals, etc. So it's similar to what you just talked about, but it's slightly different. So I'll put it in the chat the exact wording that we're going to launch this summer. Um, so 
interesting idea. I don't know whether it'll be a success or not, but we'll see how it goes. I think it's just starting a debate at the moment, really. To an early, early stage. Thanks, Richard. I think it's really tricky as well. I think the approach to looking at the kind of more common and recognised species means that you're not going to have a horde of people trampling over a rather rare, rare habitat to see a rather rare species. Um, so, and also that makes it quite inaccessible to a lot of people. So that kind of, you know, very much like, I don't know if you've seen dandelion being badged as the hero plant. Um, and, you know, suddenly a lot of people think differently about it. Does anyone have any other uh, questions for Kevin? Because I think Kevin has to shoot off. Any, anybody want to suggest an iconic species that we should be thinking about in relation to Cambridgeshire? So, Bar Edward. Barn owls. Barn owls. <laughs> <laughs> well, Do you know, I, Emma, I think, I can't think why you said that really. I mean, you know, it's like, it's not even a special interest, you know. <laughs> not um, at all. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a question about funding, but I think we might cover that off if people can stay through to the end. I think um, our Natural England speaker may have uh, be able to offer some insights into that. So. OK, and I've just seen that Matthew is waving his hand. Well, ju just to say, we did it, we did it with a logo for Cambridge Nature Network. And there we put um, the heron uh, and the butterfly and um, uh, one of the trees uh, in that. So we've, we've done we've tried to do that with Cambridge. Cambridge, sorry. Um, Brilliant. We have an aspiration in, in an organ another organisation I'm involved with to bring the large marsh grasshopper back to Cambridge too. But uh, I think it'll be in places that are a little too wet for everyone to trample over and go and see it. Peter, you have your hand up too. I tried to ask by chat, but I sent it only to Richard for some reason. I was asking what are the most iconic species in Cambridgeshire? Iconic is oh. such a tricky word, isn't it? Mm. What is iconic? Kevin, over to you. Glad you got to answer <laughs> that question. It, it, it's, I mean, I see, I, I put in ones that I thought might be useful, but <laughs> it, it, it's a, a much misused word, I think. Um, perhaps for the people of Cambridge, I live in Cambridge, we're very fond of our peregrines that nest in the city. Um, it's an, arguably an icon for us. Uh, it, it's, it's a tricky question to answer, but I think it, I think choose your aim and then work backwards to get the species. Do it that way round, I would suggest. Brilliant. Okay, any any other questions? I see that Edward um, has put in the chat about having a, some framework species um, and those that matter to a local vote, um, as well as the um, British Society of Botanical, hmm, forgot what the I stands for, um, in the once common now declining categories may be useful. So thank you for that uh, intervention. Any more for any more before I um, we move on to our next speaker. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. I hope you have a wonderful walk in nature and I'm sure we'll catch up next time you're in Cambridgeshire. So thank you very much for your talk. Right, so moving on, moving on now um, to Barn Owls and uh, Emma Ormond-Bones, who is the general manager since uh, January this year at uh, Wiccan Fen. Fabulous site to uh, to be in charge of. I'm sure you're going to have to do lots of walking around it to check up that everyone's doing their job properly. Absolutely. And and, and, and prior to that was with Essex Wildlife Trust as an area manager and then as a living landscapes uh, coordinator, but is here today because of a particular passion uh, and knowledge of uh, barn owls, which she is going to wonderfully share with us now. So thank you, Emma, and over to you. Wonderful. Thanks for that introduction, Pamela. And it's um, it's really fortuitous to come off the back of Kevin's presentation um, because I spent five years with Essex Wildlife Trust selling the concept of barn owls as a flagship species to landowners across Essex, although slightly less fortunate that Kevin didn't mention barn owls, but I'm really grateful to Richard Kay for doing so instead. So thank you, Richard. Um, I was going to start with um, talking about the ecology of barn owls, but thinking about flagship species and that, that iconic species and the fact that they represent um, a sort of a habitat, they tend to be that sort of quite often they tend to be a very visible, um, very permanent species in the landscape. I thought I'd add a slightly um, human con context. So Helen, if I'm not going to be too awkward. Could you jump to slide 13, please? Unlucky for some. 
this could, this could go terribly wrong now I've just said that so um, bear, bear with me that's it perfect so I put this in at the end of my presentation originally because I just wanted to add um, essentially something around why why we love barn owls why barn owls is an iconic species why there is so much um, there are so many organizations and individuals that spend so much time and resource um, protecting barn owls um, so I thought I'd put it in the context of us because I think we value what we what we see what we live alongside um, so barn owls um, and owls, well, barn owls first appeared in the fossil records two million years ago, and owls in general are one of the few birds to be depicted in prehistoric cave paintings, although you can see, um, for those of you, you can see the picture on the right hand side, that's definitely not a barn owl because of the ears, so, but owls in general. Um, next slide please, Helen. So we've, as um, as humans and as communities, we've lived alongside barn owls for, for centuries. Um, and, you know, it's a strong belief that we only name that which matters and that's with that which we see. So there are 42 um, names in the English language alone for barn owls. Some are very obvious, monkey-faced owl, ghost owl, death owl, and then a few odder ones, um, moggy and billywise. And that's just in the English language. That's not a Celtic language. That's not languages um, on other continents. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of folklore, again, you know, I think we talk about things that we see and that are important to us. So there was a Celtic preacher in the 12th century that, it, that tried to explain why barn owls are nocturnal. And he said that it was because the owl stole a rose that was a prize awarded for beauty and therefore the owl was punished by other um, other birds by because they only allowed it to come out at night as a result of the theft. Contra contrasting to that, you can see on the right hand side, um, a tattoo of a barn owl sitting on a rose. And some of you may be aware that you don't get something tattooed unless it's quite significant because it's quite painful. Um, so there you've got the two contrasts of the old and the new. Um, next slide, please, Helen. OK, so there's a lot of um, so obviously life and death, highly significant, probably the most important thing that we as humans think about. Um, and barn owls are associated with many aspects of that. So the early Christians believe that owls whisp um, whispered false truths. So they were like the um, the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Um, they were they were demonic. They could um, persuade people to do to do bad deeds. Um, the flip of that is that they in the, this is in England until the 19th century. Some people still believe that if you nailed an owl to a barn door, it would ward off evil. I'm pleased to tell you that since the 19th century, we haven't found any evidence of this happening. Um, barn owls are believed to be the guardian of Aboriginal women who die in Australia. They're believed to carry the soul um, to the next life. But for those of you that are concerned about the, um, the whispering of the false truths, fret not, because apparently if you put a barn owl on the floor and walk around it three times, you can convince it to wring its own neck, apparently. Next slide, please, Helen. OK, um, so then this is the more positive side of things, um, although not for the owl with the first example. Um, so owl parts um, were, were used to cure a, a range of um, illnesses from whooping cough and bad eyesight. Also drunkenness, which um, I wouldn't necessarily class as an illness, but apparently a barn owl parts would cure drunkenness. If a pregnant woman um, in Wales heard a barn owl calling, it meant her child would be blessed. If a barn owl screeched, it was supposed to predict a storm. But if the barn owl screeched during a storm, it would indicate the end of the storm. Um, these are all a bit sort of whimsical, but it just show, goes to show how long we as a society or societies have lived alongside this iconic species and that how important it is to our, our daily lives, to our life and our death and our, our traditions. Uh, next slide, please, Helen. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, have we, have we reached the end? Maybe we've reached it. That's the uh, end. So oh, yes. Yep. Excellent. In that case, do you mind going back to number one, please? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Helen, I'll owe you a cup of tea and a biscuit for this. <laughs> I'll look forward to that. 
Okay, so um, now to, so that's why, you know, alongside what Kevin was saying about flagship species, I thought I'd add that sort of human element. And then coming back to the ecology of the barn owls themselves. So um, until very recently, it was believed that there were 36 subspecies of barn owls across, across the globe. This has recently been um, reclassified to 10 subspecies. Although there's DNA evidence, um, DNA testing ongoing that suggests that some of these subspe believed subspecies may actually be species in their own right, such as the American barn owl. Um, so the, the species I'm going to talk about today is Taito alba alba, which is found in Western and Southern Europe and North Africa. So the barn owls that we have are very much at the northern end of their northern end of their range. Uh, next slide, please, Helen. So they're actually one of the most widely distributed bird species. Um, and it might beg the question when you're talking about flagship species as to why we would look to conserve this species if it's such, so widely spread. But unfortunately, although it's widely distributed, its numbers have been plummeting in the UK over the last sort of 50 to 70 years. Um, but as you can see from the map, um, they are present on every continent, um, a subspecies of, um, except Antarctica. And they, um, they are quite happy from sea level up to about 4,000 metres, which is sort of the Andes and New Guinea. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the UK species, um, Barn owls are typically found over open habitat, and I'll come on to why the physiology of that works for them soon. Um, so ideally, it's permanent rough grassland. Those tussocks um, with the optimum sort of depth of about over seven centimetres. So those tussocks are where the small mammals will, um, where they will nest and they will find cover. And that's exactly what the, ow the owls are looking for, is that tussocky grassland where they can literally swoop, scan it, swoop down and pluck out those small mammals. They will, um, in our southern landscape, they will use arable fields and hay meadows. Obviously, hay meadows has a, a time limit to them. Um, and arable fields, similarly, it tends to be when the crops are short, when the crops are much longer, much taller, it makes it much more difficult for them. But that um, demonstrates the importance of good field margins. Um, Barn owls will hunt in and around farm buildings, particularly in poor weather, and I'll come on to why poor weather is uh, such a challenge for them. Um, if you're looking to create habitat, it should be more than a kilometre away from motorways and dual carriageways because of the ways that barn owls will swoop down they, and they follow linear th features through the landscape. So what we try to avoid is them following something like a motorway verge because of the way they swoop down. They they are prone to collision with vehicles. Um, but in terms of a flagship species, they're really great for that sort of um, busy lowland area because you can, you can engage people in the, in the importance of things like wildlife corridors, um, linear features such as hedgerows, um, river corridors, that sort of thing. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of um, nesting habitats, barn owls like um, deep cavities where they're sheltered from the, from the weather and also it's at a sufficient height to avoid predation. They don't make a nest as such. Um, they will just sort of um, choose a suitable cavity. Um, the female likes to fill it with pellets, which she will then break down with her beak when they're dry. So the idea yeah, is not a nest. It's more of a quite a smelly <laughs> dark environment, uh, but it works for them. Um, so veteran tree cavities um, are ideal. And again, bringing in the importance of veteran trees within the landscape, they're that, they're that ideal kind of um, nesting habitat for barn owls, but they will also use traditional barns, haylofts, stock sheds, and church towers. Um, and the barns are an interesting one because I've come across barn owls that will actually nest amongst the hay bales. And it means that the, the farmer, the farm manager can't move those hay bales until the barn owls have, um, the barn owl young have fledged and dispersed. And I've not, I've yet to meet anyone that resents waiting that time. They, you know, they really are a loved traditional la um, species in the landscape. They like a good line of sight because as they swoop down to catch their prey, they swoop up to their nesting habitat, um, ideally two to three meters off the ground to, to um, avoid those mammalian predators um, and minimal disturbance and hazards. Although again, they, as I said, they have been found in many hay barns with tractors coming and going. They get used to the noise. They get used to that kind of rhythm of life. 
Uh, next slide, please, Helen. The wonderful thing about barn owls, uh, not that I'm biased, is that um, they are non-territorial. Um, their home ranges overlap. So effectively, in as long as there is suitable habitat to provide enough food, you will have multiple barn owls living within the landscape. And this shape of that home range varies. So as long as it's got that connectivity in some ways, it doesn't have to be um, hectares of suitable land directly in front of the nest site as long as they can move within that landscape um, to find the food that they that they require. Um, in the in the winter months they will um, search over an area of up to 5,000 hectares in the winter months. That's reduced in the summer months primarily because they are um, catching prey to bring back to their young so they it's more important to have that um, suitable habitat full of those field voles and other such mammals for them within a closer um, a closer range of the nest box. Um, as I said it's primarily dependent upon the the food supplies to how far they will disperse um, and every barn owl will have one nest site, but they can have up to three main roost sites and several occasional roost sites, um, mainly throughout the winter um, and the male once the young have reached a certain point as well. So if you have barn owls and during the autumn winter they disappear, don't be too disheartened because quite often they've gone elsewhere in the landscape to find that food and they'll roost nearer that, that food source at that particular season. Um, and it's, it's a lifelong home range if they're not disturbed and flushed elsewhere. Next slide, please, Helen. OK, so I've spoken a bit about why the barn owls, you know, they are so uh, they are beautifully adapted to those open spaces to hunting over that um, open grassland. So they've got a wingspan which averages 900 millimetres. So it's absolutely designed for for silent gliding, floating, very little flapping, very little noise, very little energy expended. Their wings are significantly longer than something like a tawny owl, which is a woodland dwelling species, which because of the nature of its environment doesn't have the, the benefit of the longer wings. They have more, more trees to avoid. <laughs> Um, they, um, their vision, uh, the barn owl's vision is in low light is better than human vision. Um, so they're geared up for those sort of dawn and dusk hunting sessions. They've also got these very, very long legs with sharp talons. So as they scan over that open grass and when they find something, they tuck their wings back, extend their legs and they pluck that small mammal from the tussock. Those long legs allow them to get into those tussocks and between those tussocks. They're almost silent in flight, um, primarily because they do, they glide and they hunt and they expend very little energy, but partly as well because their waterproofing is, um, compared to other birds on their feathers, is very low, which is why when it's wet, it's a real problem for barn owls and why we are growing in concern in terms of these extreme weather events, because as well as being wet um, so that they, you know, they lose fitness, they get cold, they're also flapping more, so they're expending energy, but because they're flapping more, they're making noise, which primarily um, means that the small mammals will hear them and will be able to avoid them, but also it means that the barn owls who hunt almost entirely by sound, um, are, uh, but basically they can't hear because they are flapping these big wet wings. So, so bad weather, particularly during nesting season, is a really bad, um, a bad event for the barn owls. Um, I said they hunt almost in, although their vision is um, in low light better than ours, they do hunt primarily by sound and they actually, their ears are actually asymmetrical. So they're offset to give them that sort of extra depth of, acu of acuity when they hunt. Uh, next slide, please, Helen. Okay, so there's very little difference um, at a glance between the male and the female. Um, the females are very slightly darker and um, sturdier and they have, a, they have the speckles on the chest, which is the real thing to look for. Um, they're generally about the same size, about 350 millimeters. Um, the average weight, um, the female is slightly heavier by 30 grams than the male, and she will actually pack on a lot of weight to 425 grams before um, pro before immediately before egg laying. Um, as I mentioned before, the lightweight feathers have got limited water repellent, so the rain can actually increase, increase um, the male and female's body weight equally by up to 77%. Um, that said, 
in good weather, although they glide and they hunt, they can actually achieve air speeds of up to 25 kilometers an hour. But in the natural environment, you would very rarely see that because there is no need to expend that, that energy. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so <laughs> there are three main sounds that um, might indicate that you've got barn owls nearby if you can't actually see them. The primary one is the harsh scream. It lasts for about two seconds and that's why um, it tends to be associated with sort of the ghostly appearance as well, particularly um, before the days of electricity and street lighting, you can imagine hearing that harsh scream coming out of the darkness. Um, that is advertising that they're there. Um, that is saying this, this is my, I mean, although they're not territorial, they will um, defend their nest site. Um, so that is what that is, that's an advertising. Um, you would be less likely to hear the purring call that they make. That's between usually between the male and the female, um, the male inviting the, net, the female to the nest site and vice versa, and also the female begging for food when she's sitting on the eggs. Um, equally, you, you'd be very likely, very unlikely to hear it unless you're actually monitoring nest boxes. Um, but, th for, but for any of you that has done that before, you might be familiar with the hiss and the chicks um, and the adults will both produce this hiss. And it's a way of trying to deter predators and intruders to the nest site. So sometimes you might get something like a jackdaw um, trying to take up residency in the, um, the nesting space of the barn owl. And that's, that would trigger that hissing from all of those chicks. Um, and actually it's quite a loud sound when they all do it together. It's quite, it's quite startling when you're three meters up a ladder and you hear that. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so they expend a lot of energy in, um, in their breeding. Um, males and females um, will, they don't pair for life. It's, um, it's not quite as romantic as that, but they will return to the same nest site. So if, if the same pair return time after time, they will naturally pair up together. And the more experienced pairs will start breeding earlier. In the, in the year, the less experienced pairs will take longer. So it tends to be late winter, early spring with late winter to be more those experienced pairs. Um, they lay um, asynchronously. Um, so it's laying an egg um, every, on average, every two and a half, three days for a minimum of about 10 days. Um, so they average um, about five to six eggs. Um, during the incubation, the male will ro roost with the female, but after that, when they're brooding, when the chicks are fledging, the male will roost somewhere nearby in the landscape, but not in that nest box. Um, it takes, um, the, the female will sit on the eggs um, for 31 days, but that's 31 days per egg. So if you think that's probably another two weeks on top of that, because they're, because they're laid in that staggered intervals. Um, the brooding takes um, three weeks, so the male will be very busy um, bringing food along with the female as well. And then there's about 56 days for the chicks to fledge. So the shortest possible time from egg to fledging is 101 days, which is a real investment for those barn owls and demonstrates why it's so important that they get those continuous food sources, ideally close to the box during that period. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so the clutch size is usually between five to six eggs, um, of which you'd expect about four or five to hatch. Um, you'd, but by the time you're reaching fledging success, you're looking at two or three young. And this is based on a good year with good food supply. Um, that said, the um, barn owls do a lot of um, fraternicide. So the, um, the siblings will eat each other until very recently. Um, it was, yes, thanks Pamela. <laughs> Until very recently, it was believed that um, they would only eat their siblings um, when there was no other food source available, but they have been witnessed recently eating their siblings when there's a fresh fold next to them. So sometimes uh, they just do it because they want to. <laughs> uh, next slide please, Helen. Okay, so the young will hang around the, the nest box site for sort of um, 84 to 112 days. The adults might become a slightly aggressive to encourage them to move off into the landscape. And they do so gradually. They'll explore the first kilometer, um, three kilometers within the first month and they expand and expand until they found their own new home range, which may or may not overlap with their parents um, by usually November. Um, the, the average wildlife spot span is four years but um, without those environmental pressures in captivity it can be up to 15 years. Uh, next slide please. 
And I just thought I'd put this in as the last slide just to um, show you the differences between day 14 and day 63 for those barn owls. Um, and you can see quite how much they grow and quite how much investment there is from the parents there. And that's everything. Thank you very much. Wow, that is an astonishing amount to uh, pack in. Um, to, uh, <laughs> to <laughs> Too much, possibly, sorry. <laughs> a, a, a fabulous run through of almost everything you ever wanted to know about Barnard. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. I, I thought we might uh, group our questions because we've, we've next got a, 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 a talk about frogs and toads. And I thought perhaps we might have a kind of species we've just talked about um, series of questions um, that will both ask questions of Emma of James and of James so if you've, if you've got questions you can always put them in the chat but also hang on to them and then we'll be we'll move on to uh, James and then after that talk we'll have time for, for lots of questions. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, James McCady um, who after 10 years in the RAF uh, joined Frog Life in uh, 2010 and had roles such as I mean I think this is fabulous the River Neen or Nen depending when you come from Dragon Finder. I mean, who does not want a title to be a dragon finder? I don't know if you found the dragon, maybe you can tell us. Um, uh, and then uh, did a, a part of that, did a project um, kind of understanding and restoring um, orchards uh, across the East of England. And is currently operations manager for Frog Life Ecological Services. And is going to tell us today all about frogs and toads. So fabulous, welcome James, and um, over to you. Thank you, Pamela. It makes me sound a bit grander than I actually am, but I'll, um, when I've got my, let me just get my um, stopwatch ready to go, because I've got quite a few to get through. Am I um, as well getting Helen, can I share my screen and do it so I can quick click through, or do you want me to? Uh, I don't mind, I can I, uh, not share if that's helpful, and you can. Let me, you let should me be see if this there. works, because as, as you've seen, I've got a, uh, a lot to get through, haven't I? Let me see if this works. If it don't, then uh, we'll have to rely on you, Helen. No, I think we're okay. Looks like we're okay. Okay. There we go. Is that it? Is that is that showing? Brilliant. All right, let's go. Yeah, right. I've worked it out. I've got. Let me start my stopwatch because I've got roughly two point one two slides per minute so i'm going to race through this quickly right we're off frog or toad so most common question i get asked apart from how i got into this sort of line of work is difference between a frog and a toad hopefully after this you'll all be able to tell frog life trust amphibian and reptile conservation charity um we started off in uh 89 i think it was um, like I said, I've been here for about 14 years. We do lots of nice public engagement, education work, um, research, project deliver delivery and uh, events as well. Alongside the Frog Life Trust is the charity. We've got Frog Life Ecological Services, which Pamela um, sort of told you about. I'm heavily involved in and basically anything. It's, just, it's a, a trading arm of the Frog Life Trust. And anything that can bring us in money um, to be gift aided back to the charity we go through frog life ecological services. So this is the majority of my work, surveys, mostly habitat work, but also training courses and uh, stuff like wildlife tunnel monitoring, which we do a lot of as well. We manage a couple of nature reserves for um, Peterborough City Council here in Peterborough, where I'm based, um, but we've got a good presence up and down the uh, country as well, um, ranging from a group in Scotland, we've got Yorkshire, um, Midlands now, we've got a small team, Peterborough, London and on the south coast. So it's a really good spread, but there's only 25 of us, quite a small um, charity, but a nice charity to work for. So native British amphibians worldwide, around about 500 um, different species, Newton salamander, frogs and toads, about 5,600. Luckily for my small brain, I only have to remember seven um, native amphibians, nice and easy, common frog, which majority of people will know most of these, common toad, Natajack Toad, Smooth New, Powermate New, Great Crested New, and the fancy one that pops up at the end, which is probably quite nice and relevant after our talk by Kevin this morning, um, Pool Frog. Um, species, so key ID on Common Frog, uh, nice smooth skin, this bandit mask behind the eyes that you can see there clearly, 
two dorsal ridges that run down the back, you can see there. Big, powerful back legs to jump away from predation, heavily striped. Smooth skin, normally the sort of most easily identifiable of the species that, that we work with. Loads of variation in coloration, markings. But if you look at all those four pictures, even though they're totally different in, in color, they've all got the same key ID features. That quite sort of angular, nice sort of handsome, pretty face with the, the bandit mask behind the eyes, dorsal ridges and those big, powerful striped back legs. Common toad, so this is the difference. The common toad, uh, much rougher, sort of wartier skin. So they're full of these, um, these bufo toxins, which make them quite um, distasteful to predation. So they can coexist with fish a lot easier than common frogs. So you quite often find common toads in larger water bodies than you would the common frog. Much shorter hind legs than the common frog. They walk rather than hop. They can hop, they can jump, but they tend to walk more so than, than, than jump. Um, really lovely, sort of beautiful, good looking, um, regal looking eye. I think that on the common toad really tells it apart as well with that nice horizontal um, sort of pupil through the middle. So it's the lumpy, bumpy skin, the sort of rugby ball shaped glands behind the eyes rather than the bandit mask of the common frog and that lumpy, bumpy skin, which makes the common toad uh, quite easy to distinguish. Spawn and tadpoles. Um, most people, you know, again, totally aware. One of my like, early experiences as a child going looking for, for frog spawn. Big clumps, 2,000 odd eggs laid. Good sign of um, spring on its way. And toad spawn laid in strings, which you can see nice and easily there in the net on the right hand side. Um, tadpoles, common frog, uh, more mottled in colour. And uh, toad tadpoles tend to stay this sort of inky oily black what we up to four minutes 12 we're doing good Com uh, pool frog um thought to be extinct reintroduced over on a top secret site in norfolk um and actually doing well now i'm thinking two sites over in norfolk thompson's common and um, we've got the pool frog doing well over there easier to id because of that nice sort of lime greeny yellowy stripe down the center of the back and on the males which the common frog doesn't have these big vocal sacs you can see in the top right hand side Natterjack toad, um, mainly sort of um, confined to coastal sort of sand dune areas, grazing marshes, um, sandy heathland, um, lovely little toad with that, again, that really nice sort of visible uh, stripe down the centre of the back. And these are really nice to watch. If you ever look on YouTube, you can see them moving around. They tend to sort of run. They prefer these sort of smaller ephemeral ponds and they tend to run quite sort of comedic for those um, as old as me and remember the Benny Hill show that you see sort of see them sort of moving along quite quickly to the Benny Hill soundtrack. If you ever look on YouTube, you see that. Um, newts, um, again, nice and easily for me, only three to remember of our native newts, smooth or common, palmate newt and the yeah. or great crested newt. There's a couple of non-natives down the bottom, which I won't go into because we're on a, a timeline. So smooth male newt or common newt, smooth newt's a nice one. Um, probably number two in the uh, world sexy new um, listing. Got that lovely, big, fancy, flashy tail that you can see top right. Got this really um, nice, sort of smooth. They've got undulating crest there, but more of a ridge that runs from the back of the head all the way to the tip of the tail. And these lovely big spots on it as well. Good looking, male, smooth, new. Female, um, you know, I'm probably a little bit biased. I've got to be careful what I say. Not as flamboyant as the male, um, I don't want to say boring in appearance, but stick-like, nothing really sort of jumps out on a female newt, uh, much sort of smaller to a point uh, tail on the on the female newt, um, no ridge or crest along the back, yeah. And there's a nice comparison slide there. So you've got them on the picture on the left, the male smooth with those lovely big sort of almost like leopard print spots and the female smooth next to him with the much sort of smaller um, less distinguishable spots and then on the right hand side there the male smooth on the right with those lovely big sort of markings and spots and the female much narrower sort of tapered tail and uh, two dark lines along her flanks rather than in these lovely big spots our mate new are much fussier in the sort of water bodies they like more sort of acidic um, ponds so they're a bit rarer especially around our area in east england but we have got them on certain sites um, on the male, these lovely big sort of palmated webbed 
iron feet like whirly boots, um, a filament at the end of the tail that you can see in that bottom right hand picture. And um, also they've got a sort of a break in the pattern. You can see my screen's covered by the Zoom chat, but if you can see the bottom right hand picture, they've got like a break in the pattern in along the center of the tail, like it almost looks like binary code. So that's the male power mate. Smallest of the three new species as well. Female, very similar to, to the smooth new female. Nothing really jumps out, not as easy to sort of distinguish as, as the sort of flamboyant show off males that we've got. So female power mate, um, more a marbled colour along the side than the uh, smooth female. But again, nothing really jumps out as, as clearly as, as it does on the males. Um, if you're handling them or you've got them in your, in your bottle traps or you're able to sort of see underneath them, then the, the key way of sort of telling the power mate female against the smooth new female is that lack of, lack of coloration or markings on the power mate female's throat. So if you look at the pictures on the right hand side, almost sort of translucent, um, very sort of hardly any markings at all. And the smooth female got that yellow coloring and that, that nice patterning under her throat. Also on the power mate female, sometimes you can see these white nodules on the hind feet as well. Great crested newt, so number one in the sexy newt list. Um, really good looking newt, the, the male there, fancy, big, flashy tail, um, largest of the, the newt species. So on average, sort of 15 centimetres, but we pulled one out the other day was about 19 centimetres. So really good size, massive in comparison to the two smaller newts, which are normally around about 12 centimetres with a power mate, nine or 10. Um, GCM male, really key ID features that jump out. This silvery white flash, that all these sort of features are really more sort of dominant when you tend to see them during the breeding season. So they've got a much rougher, wartier skin, it used to be known as the warty newt, um, but it's like a granular appearance, um, which is different to the small newts. Silvery white flash down the center of the tail, orange rings on the fingers and toes, and that crest, which is not like a, a shark fin or a, or a dolphin's fin, it flaps over outside of the water. So it stands up nice and straight in that top picture in water and if you look at it in hand on the right hand side it's flopped over to the side out of the water. Female slightly larger than the males well certainly longer and not short and stocky um, no crest on her um, but she's still got this lovely big sort of long tapered tail with a normally an orange or yellow underside along the tail. Um, got really distinctive belly patterns on GCN and their individual they're, they're, they're sort of individualistic. So like our fingerprints, every GCN has got its own belly pan, which is good for identifying individuals and, and tracking them. Um, all got these lovely, nice sort of regal orange or yellow rings on the fingers and toes. Uh, and there's a nice comparison down the bottom left there against the uh, smooth new um, in size difference. So even if you get one that's similar in length, the, the actual thickness and size of the GCN is, is totally different to the smaller of the other two newts. Um, what do I do to um, help sort of conserve our species? So that I just literally went through my folders and grabbed some pictures from the last sort of probably four, five, six months of work. Um, and this is just some of the things that I do through Fez um, to help our species. So a nice little project. We've done lots of work with Spitterfield City Farm and uh, they've got a few ponds there that were in a bad state. So I went and with the help of corporate volunteers, restored those ponds and actually created a, a new one as well. And it's a lovely little site right in the um, city of London. And um, they've got loads of GCN smooth newts there, um, really nice. Ramsey Pond, one I've just been working on recently, um, probably over there this afternoon, really bad state, as you can see from the pictures, um, dried out, nice green, green water, full of reeds, not great. Um, and we just made using hazel faggot retaining wall, which you can see in that top right. We made a bit of a holding area and we managed to desilt the pond, stack all this silt behind this sort of uh, retaining wall. All the water could flow back through the membrane into the pond and hold that silt in situ because it was a real problem to take the silt off of site. So it's retained in situ and then that silt was now flighted up as a bit of a uh, marshy area. Um, the council put a fountain in, you can see bottom right there. So that's how it looked last week when they sent me that picture. Um, we planted loads up in that marsh area, so they should have a big bloom of colour very soon. 12 minutes, we're doing well. Um, talk to, where was that? Oh, I've done lots of training with Anglia Ruskin University and also Brighton University and a couple of the others. 
um, where I've gone in and I nearly broke the internet when they made me internet sensation there, um, giving a talk on, on GCN and the work that we do. Um, Dupont, so down on the south coast, I've been doing some work restoring um, old Duponds, which has been really interesting because it's um, nothing like the ponds that we do in and around this area where we're blessed with beautiful clay, um, which obviously chalk and flint and a bit more difficult working down there. So there's some of the Duponds that have been neglected for quite some time. Um, GCN training, so this year I delivered um, Great Crested Newt working towards licensed training to approximately about 250 um, people from different walks of life and that's been keeping me busy and um, bringing us some money in for the charity as well and tunnel monitoring as well which is really interesting so we do a lot of tunnel monitoring on wildlife tunnels and how um, successful they are and how um, well wildlife are using these tunnels the bottom two are just um, off of some of our trail cams on one of the reserves we manage uh, got nothing to do with tunnel monitoring, but I just like that picture because it's a nice dirty badger and uh, some nice otters down the bottom left as well. Uh, I Green, so this is one of the reserves we managed for the Peterborough City Council, and we've done some nice pond restoration work there. And within, well, not even a year, we've got um, GCM breathing in one of the new ponds. And um, yeah, it's been a nice little project right on the doorstep. And that is under 1459, that's 1344. So I'm happy with that, but the slide is obviously inaccurate. That's it. Brilliant. Thank you very much, James. Another whirlwind tour, tour uh, through amphibians. So thank you. Um, so we've got a couple of um, questions in the chat. The, the first two questions are for uh, James, but please do either use the reaction button to raise your hand, wave at me if you think I might see you, um, or put a question in the chat. So the first question um, is from Lucy, um, which is, if the fall fog has been reintroduced, was it once native? And I, I know we have Roger Mitchell, who's kind of rather an expert in that on here too, but uh, James, for you. Yeah, well, well, obviously a lot of people brighter than me had a, a long discussion um, along it, and it was um, actually determined that it was um, native, and I think they reintroduced it back over in Norfolk, right in 2005 sometime, um, yeah, for three years, and... Uh, it stayed as this sort of top secret site. It's actually nice because I'd done training with Brighton University and one of the lecturers there was, I think, involved in the actual project. So it was quite interesting to sort of speak and hear about it from, from an expert. So. Brilliant. Roger, do you want to say anything more about the Paul Frog, if in case people are interested? Well, it, it has its ups and downs. We've It's been uh, reintroduced back to a, a site in Norfolk, in a pingo site, a pond. Where it, it uh, the last uh, last few were were found in the uh, that, that end of the last century, it's not doing too badly. But with any introduced species, the population numbers are quite low. We actually have it on two sites now, and it's a, a number of ponds on both sites. And we're keeping our fingers crossed that uh, with this uh, strange weather we're getting these days, with climate change, it'll 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 uh, last out. Thank you. Um, and then the next question, uh, interestingly framed, is, is from Peter, around how often does preserving, uh, presumably great crested newts in particular, um, these creatures interfere with planning applications? Um, I, I don't know, in the ecological services, you're probably an expert in the um, district licensing as well as the general DPN. Um, so, James, I think another question for you. How, how does, sorry, Pamela, what was the question? How? How do, how often does preserving these creatures interfere with planning applications? Uh, I'm probably a bit biased, but I'd say not often enough. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of bias. Quantity that's probably only known by Natural England in, in its <laughs> licensing uh, uh, conditions. Yeah, yeah. We, we've had recently actually quite topical because we've had a, a discussion um, with Natural England about. Um, being involved in the actual creation of new ponds um, with district level licensing. It's something that's been discussed with um, trustees at, at Frog Life for some time uh, as to whether we should be involved or whether we shouldn't. Um, and obviously, you know, creating ponds and creating new habitat is something that I'm sort of quite keen and passionate about. So um, hopefully, you know, we, we'll be doing more, more pond work through that. And just to say more broadly, the kind of lack of success of there are some newts, um, let's just move them almost only a step away 
and hope that, you know, in the midst of a new building site, they will survive. But instead saying there are some newts here, they're unlikely to survive the development. Let's actually create suitable habitat for them a bit further away. Um, and that then is part of the licensing that the developer has to, to fund and agree with overseen by Natural England. So it's a kind of new approach, um, Peter, that is hopefully going to see both the flourishing great trusted newts and the ability for people to um, build houses where they need to. Any questions for Emma around this? I mean, I, it's almost like we, we, there's nothing we don't know now about bar barn owls. Um, so uh, it was it was so comprehensive. Um, Helen, you have a question or an intervention? It was actually a question, I guess, which could be asked of both James and Emma. I'm That's just wondering brilliant. if there was um, what the top three threats were to each of those species and the top three things we could do that would improve their uh, sort of population sizes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we go with Emma first, and then, then we'll um, we'll give um, James. Okay, I'll um I'll give it a go. Um, so for for barn owls, I'd say um, extreme weather event events are uh, increasing concern. Um, I would say probably the lack of nesting habitat. Um, I mean, so that's where it's really important to um, work with landowners to. Um, conserve veteran trees but also where um, old barns are coming yeah. down that might have had suitable sort of holes replacing those with with nest boxes working with landowners to install nest boxes in trees um, because one of those nest boxes on a tree all the owl is looking for is that dark hole which is exactly what a nest box replicates on the front of a tree um, and the third one it's probably the lack of hunting habitat, I think. And, and again, that's where um, it, it's great to engage landowners. Um, if not, you know, if they can't, like most of us, set aside hectares of tussocky grassland, um, the importance of um, margins, like uh, wildflower margins around your fields, particularly, you know, when the arable crop comes off, retaining that margin during the nesting season provides that linear linear hunting habitat. So I would say habitat management and installing nest boxes, um, less obvious what we do about extreme events, but I think, you know, the nest boxes and the habitat would be the main ones. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, and James, over to you. Uh, probably habitat um, fragmentation. So on the um, GTN training, it's quite nice because one of the sites that we, we do the training on, I can actually stand up and I can show them because I've known the site for about 14 years. I can talk them through the development on every side and it's now become a reserve that's sort of split into three um, with development all the way around it, which is totally different landscape to when I first started. Um, like Emma said, the weather last year, all right, good for my tan, this 40 degree heat, but um, some of the ponds I've never, ever seen dry were, were, were bone dry last year, which is, you know, people argue not, not a terrible um, terrible thing if it's at the right time of year but how do you ensure that they're not drying out you know look at out the window now and we've got so many ponds with um you know new larvae in that if they dry out now it could be absolute disaster um and the lack of good sort of breeding ponds as well there was a study done on the amount of um the the, the, the fall in in good breeding ponds and it was um again i think it was like 61 percent decline it was it was a huge decline in good breeding ponds for our species. And I just think back to when I was a kid and every house we moved to, the first thing in the garden, dad would put a pond in. Um, and now, you know, I think I've seen a change in the last sort of, probably sort of eight years that, that a lot more people now, younger people are, are sort of becoming more concerned with the environment and what they can do. And we are getting a lot more questions. Whereas at first it was, how can I make the pond safe in the garden for the children? Now they're asking me more about pond design and what's better for wildlife, where it can go, and uh, you know maybe a, a hopefully a, more of a, a steer away from all this sort of risk averseness we have in ponds in garden and such like. So yeah, hopefully that has that's answered. Brilliant, thank you. No, that's really really comprehensive, and we're astonishingly running perfectly to time. So thank you very much to uh, all of our speakers so far and all of our questioners. Um, Next, we have um, two talks um, around the subject of volunteers and communities. Um, so uh, a slightly different um, take on and working with species. Uh, and 
first of all, um, I would like to introduce Howard Jones, uh, whose project on orchards I uh, um, mistakenly uh, attributed to uh, James, so apologies about that, Howard. Um, uh, but Howard, after 15 years as a solicitor, um, moved on to working uh, in nature conservation uh, with UEA on, on orchards and is now uh, working on the with um, Hampshire Acre, fabulous uh, organization working with rural communities um, and their needs and in particular around nature in, in relation to here but he is the new life in the old west fabulous name project uh, project manager which is a heritage lottery uh, funded landscape scale um, project and uh, Howard is going to talk to us about species monitoring with community um, volunteers cool thanks Pamela uh, thanks so much for that over to you that very thorough introduction. But when, when you tell me it was fifteen years as a lawyer, I think, gosh, is it really that long? And it was actually fourteen, but I was rounding up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was, it was, it was long enough. It was long enough. <laughs> but there we are. Um, no, thanks, everybody, for, for inviting me along. Um, as Pamela said, I've, I've, I could talk, I hope, within fifty minutes about some work we've been doing with community volunteers in um, in, in our area, what I call the New Life in the Old West area, where um, we're, we're trying to encourage people to become wildlife recorders and it's quite a challenge it's, it's um uh, to, to get people started quite often people have, with no skills or, or, or knowledge at all come, 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 we're, we're training up so it's been very enjoyable and um i'll i'll, I'll talk to you about it now um helen if, if, if you like i can share these i can do these slides myself because i've got <laughs> quite a few as well so sure. that would be easier i'll just try and share the screen is that working no it's not because i haven't pressed share How's that? That's good. Good, brilliant. Let's turn out. Now I've got to move that over there. Super. Okay. So um, I won't talk too much about myself, seeing Pamela gave me such a good introduction. Um, new, where's that gone? Just a moment. Right up there. Oops, it daisies. Right, this is not doing especially well. Okay, so I've got the right button. So new, new, new life in the Old West, um, we're working in an area of Cambridgeshire between uh, Wiccan Fen to the east and across as far as um, Ouse Fen further west. It's an area which is more or less contiguous with the, the old course of the Old West River, which of course is the original course of the River Great Ouse. And that's where you get our project name from. Um, we're working on both sides of the river in about nine different parishes from as far south as um, Rampton and Cottenham, closer to Cambridge, up um, north of the river, up to, um, oh gosh, uh, Witchford and, and Haddenham Way. So quite, quite a big area. The idea is you've got these two fantastic reserves at either end. We're trying, we've been trying to put in um, what we're calling stepping stones, which are smallish areas of habitat in between reserves to allow wildlife to move more freely between these, these, great, these great fantastic reserves. So we've been working on a mix of farmland and uh, community green spaces. Um, we're coming towards the end of the project. Now we finish next uh, April. And um, so I'd say about 90% of the larger habitat work has been completed. Well, more than that, actually, we've probably got two sites left to do. Um, some of the examples we've been doing are pond complexes. Um, this one shows one at Haney Farm, which is a G's Fresh Farm um, uh, near Barway. Uh, three ponds went in in an in a un, un, uncultivated corner of a field. Uh, we've also been doing corner ponds where ditch networks intersect on, on farmland and um, creating berms, which I think people will probably know is a, 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 a long stretch of um, shallow water alongside um, uh, drains and ditches. Um, no more than about 50 to 75 centimetres wide, and we aim for a depth of, say, about 10 to 20 centimetres, which, of course, fluctuates depending upon the water level in the ditch. Um, another example we've been working this is a farm in Willingham, where we did a combination of habitats, uh, 800 metres of the ditch berm, and uh, with also a, a riverbank lagoon, which comes off the old west itself, and some shallow ponds, uh, a mixed native species uh, hedge near a pond, which is um, an area where turtle doves have been known to, to breed relatively recently. Also install, installing some coirolls and planting some native black poplar trees at the farm as well. So quite a few little things to try and make the farm more, more wildlife friendly. So here's some of the work we've been doing. Um, top left hand side, that's um, the, uh, the, the lagoon coming off the, 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 the river, 
um, it's varying depths as you move away from the entrance to the river, it gets progressively shallower, so it turns more into a scrape as uh, uh, further away from the river. So hope to benefit a, a good wet range of um, wildlife which needs different sorts of water depths. Uh, you can see a, a berm, which is one at um, Willow Grange Farm, which is near Chittering, which has just been completed. And uh, also another berm in the process of being dug. This is the long one at Queenholm, where the excavator is. Um, as, and also various ditch corner ponds and um, areas of small areas of additional water to, in, in, in the landscape, which, as you all know, is a very dry landscape, especially for the weather we're having nowadays. So trying to make these more accessible areas of, of water for, for various types of wildlife. Some more of the work we've been doing. This is a um, left hand side is a field corner pond at um, Bedrill Hay Farm, which is near Little Thetford. Um, this again, we hope will be to uh, benefit turtle doves. Um, there's an area of very scrubby woodland right next to the pond. It used to be an orchard and it's become very thorny and scrubby and looks pretty impressive turtle dove nesting habitat. And the farmer already provides um, uh, supplementary feeding for turtle doves. So with this easily accessible water source, we're make, 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 making life easier for these birds, which um, are very thirsty. They need to have a water source because they survive entirely off, off grain and seeds, etc. cetera. Um, right hand side, again, uh, some of the ponds we put in at Haney Farm was a big, big job of work taking about two, three weeks of the, the, in all. And you can see at the back, we've created a, a bank, which we hope in time will become a nesting habitat for kingfishers potentially. So as well as working on farmland, we've been working with um, local communities, working mainly on parish council land in um, nine parishes. And there we're doing a, a, a range of different work, some of it quite small scale, like the three pictures at the top where um, with a gang of volunteers, we dug a small wildlife pond um, on a, um, <coughs> a, a green, community green space in Little Thetford. And also some much larger work where some of the parishes, um, this, one's, this one's at um, Cottenham, have been kind enough to host um, a, a large scale habitat improvements where uh, you can see their bottom right hand picture. It's a quite a large complex of three ponds of differing depths, which was dug on a rec old recreation ground in Cottenham. Um, that was done just before the, the drought and the heat wave last summer. So it took quite a while for it to start hold holding water. But um, after the winter, we, we've got um, water depths varying from about two and a half meters in, in one patch up to about 15 centimeters in, in, in shallow areas, which will turn to Will dry out to become scrapes and um, you can see there we had a gang of volunteers out um, planting a, a hedge around the pond over the winter so we hope it will turn to pretty good um, uh, nesting habitat as well as a water source. Also we've been working in woodlands um, This I find that um, running uh, habitat work parties is a very good way to start recruiting volunteers and then as some of these people have become more interested in uh, learning about um, different wildlife species and, and moving into recordings so this has been quite, quite a good way to get people involved in the project initially. So we can see doing some coppicing, um, planting hedges, et cetera, working with um, scout groups and cub groups to plant trees. Uh, they're planting some oak trees in the middle bottom picture there. Also, we've been creating um, areas of uh, wildflower, um, it's part of some traditional wildflower meadows, such as in um, the cemetery top left hand corner there in, in Cottenham where uh, volunteers scattered obviously after cutting and scarifying and raking scattering wildflower seeds and, and, and a good proportion of yellow rattle in the hope of establishing a, a, a wildlife rich area in the um, in the cemetery um, also planting plug plants bottom left hand corner which have grown by volunteers for us at Emmaus Cambridge and uh, they've been planted into areas of um, community land which is more heavily managed where, for example, temporary car parks or dog walking areas. So putting in things like white clover and sinker foil, which will cope with a, a more heavy mowing regime, but still potentially flower and provide um, nectar and um, pollen sources for, for, for pollinators. We've had um, a lot of community engagement going on, including running open for nature days, um, try, trying to attract people again to, show, to start to show an interest in the wildlife around them and possibly become recorders with us. These have been pretty successful as well. Um, obviously, always a good way to get started is to work with primary schools, go through the children and get the parents essentially. And we've been doing grow wild sessions where kiddies grow little um, uh, seeds or yoga pots, take them home and grow poppies, etc. 
obviously bug hotels, you, you can't run a community engagement project without doing at least a dozen bug hotels. And also um, working with the, um, the children to create wildflower rich areas in their, in their school grounds. So to, to, as I mentioned, we've rec been recruiting people to, to, to do um, to become wildlife recorders. And of course, this has involved quite a lot of training. And we've been really fortunate to work with some fantastic local experts in, to, to help us in um, start people off in um, being able to identify different sorts of, of wildlife. Um, examples include Green Willows Associates, Steve Parnwell's firm, who have helped us with um, uh, newt, reptile, um, amphibian identification. Came to bat walk have trained people up in using um, uh, simple uh, bat monitors to identify bats in their villages. Uh, we worked with um, Bill Mansfield in uh, to, to, to start people who are getting involved in moth trapping, and with um, the Kemsha uh, Mawa group as well to uh, to show kiddies mainly um, bank voles etc. which are living in our hedges. Uh, we've also been running um, regular uh, training events um, at various nature reserves, so uh, quite a lot of um, winter winter wader walks, winter waterfowl walks, also summer migrant bird identification we, we, we ran in May and June, trying to get people to tune into the bird song around them. Um, wildflower identification training, which we, we've got, got one coming up at Trumpeting Meadows in a, a week or so. Um, we've also been running this ourselves on some of the sites we've been working on and get people get their eye in for identifying some of the more common wildflowers. Uh, this year we've concentrated on dragonflies as well because I had a lot of interest from um, volunteers who've improved their birding skills to actually get involved in, in, in recognising dragonflies as well. So that's a, another area we've been working on. And as well as um, running uh, courses and workshops, we've um, provided some very simple information on our website. Uh, to, for people who haven't been able to come along. So some simple ID sheets, you see some wading birds and moorhen, et cetera, on the right-hand side. And also a, a guide to how people can set up a, a simple wildlife transect, uh, choosing a route, making sure it's accessible all year round, making sure they're on rights of ways, um, what they should be looking for, where they can get information to, for, for identification and recognition, um, who, you know, obviously how to make a biological record, who, where, when, what, and um, also information on submitting. The original, that they, people tend to submit to us. Um, we're trying to encourage people, because of course project finishes eventually, trying to encourage people to think about using um, iSpot and obviously um, submitting records directly to CPERC as well eventually, which would be a, 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 a great um, legacy of the project if we had more, more, more recorders in the area. So some more um, simple identification uh, information we have on our website, these are developed with um, BCN Wildlife. So covering some common flowers you see along ditches and rivers, such as meadow rue, and some of the farmland birds, which um, we, we, again are not, not that well known to, 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 to people generally because of their little brown jobs, obviously. So um, as much information on farmland birds has been quite useful for, to get people up and, and, and recording as well. Uh, we've obviously created, I think about 90, I think it's 95 different habitat sites altogether, and we've um, put together some uh, information upon how volunteers can get involved in actually monitoring a new site. So um, that's really useful for us, obviously. We ought to see what impact we've had, and uh, we ought to see the impact going forward as well over the next um, five to ten years. So we've got some, uh, obviously, location information and some idea what people might see there and also information on parking and, and access. And these have been very popular. Um, these two particular sites have now got regular volunteers going um, ev every month according what they see, and also taking um, fixed point uh, photographs of the sites just so we can watch as they, they develop and um, dry out as well on occasions with the um, very strange weather. Um, obviously fixed point photography is something which most people can do, especially seeing it, people seem to uh, carry around their smartphones everywhere. And we have a guide uh, online via YouTube to, to get people involved in that as well. And we're finding now, as time goes by, we're getting some useful um, photo, photo, photos through. And it's a good way for us to see how um, our, our habitat is, is doing. Um, so what's gone well? We've had a lot of people who've um, come a lot to, to a lot of our events and have been involved, uh, who've reported new connections with each other and with nature and with other people in their um, 
uh, their, their communities. We're getting deeper engagement now. We're getting local groups coming to us with ideas for habitat monitoring, coming to us with um, wanting advice upon um, identifying things on their own ground schools, for example. Uh, we're working with Sustainable Cottenham and um, Hedderman Conservation and various scout groups who are identifying delivering their own projects. Um, we get some really good feedback where people have enjoyed coming to uh, high quality learning sessions and um, people saying that new life in the old west has become part of their lives and um, and that that's something which they hope to carry on doing um, after, after we pack up next year. What's gone less well? Well, we've got about 2,000, it's more than that now, it's been probably about two and a half thousand individual records, which I've received from about 20 recorders. Uh, the target was 30 to 40, so we've got some way to go. Um, some of this is an ad hoc recording where people um, send in things they've seen of interest, sometimes in their garden, sometimes in their, in their area. But we've got about 12 people who are doing regular transects, which is very pleasing. So we're getting monthly um, uh, transect reports over the summer. Quite often it goes down to three monthly in the worst weather of the winter, which is, which is probably fair enough. Um, and also we've got but some of those people as well, as I mentioned, are also doing regular monitoring at some of our new um, habitat sites, which is which is fantastic. Consistency is a, a problem. It's obviously people have got busy lives, volunteers have got other things they're involved in as well. And we find there are gaps quite often. And that, that's perfectly understandable. Um, communication and dealing with the wider community is always a problem with this sort of project. Um, Obviously, it's easy to talk to people who are already committed. So, of course, we've got many people who are wildlife trust members or national trust members involved. But the harder to reach groups are still proven to be quite hard to reach. So, um, it's 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 something we've got to look at for the remainder of the project. It's trying to trying to pull in different people as well. Um, volunteer monitoring has highlighted some problems as well in that it, with our habitat creation, especially the extremely annoying early mowing by. Um, very enthusiastic groundsmen of our wildflower areas has come up a couple of times and also um, ponds drying out which is no great surprise with the extreme weather we've had obviously but it's, it goes to show how useful having people on the ground has, has been to us in, um, in, 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 in dealing with um, our habitat creation. So I think I've got within 15 minutes more or less, thank you very much um, and uh, any questions of course please fire away. Thank you, Howard. That was great. And you were exactly spot on for your um, 50 minutes. I was going to group, but actually we've got a couple of questions in the chat. So let's let's take those now and then we'll move on to um, Tony. So Elizabeth has got two questions. Uh, one is what's in it for farmers? And then the next one is so how is this continuing? Uh, and I think you kind of began to speak about what might the legacy be. So perhaps yeah, um, so what, what's in it for through. farmers? Well, we, we're, we're very generously funded by the National Lottery um, Heritage Fund. So um, the farmers involved with us have had the opportunity to create um, wildlife habitat on, on, on their land, obviously usually choosing parts of the land which aren't so productive, like um, uh, boggy field corners or et cetera. And they've been able to do this with, without any cost or, or involvement in uh, organising planning, et cetera, et cetera, at all. So it's been a fantastic opportunity for people to start doing some of these projects themselves. Obviously, we, we've been working with farmers in who already are quite minded towards conservation work to an extent anyway. We worked closely with people involved in the Ely Nature Friendly Farming Group, for example. So what we were pushing at an open door to a certain extent. Um, one, one of the best things has been that as, as time has gone by, landowners who weren't originally involved in the project have come forward and asked if we can advise on creating habitats on their land as well and that's been very positive because you're starting to see people who aren't necessarily heavily involved in nature in, in nature friendly farming showing an interest so that, that's been very positive um what happens next while well, our funding finishes uh at the end of uh, at april next year april 2020 24 it is and of course it is um we have we we'll have a band of volunteers so i very much hope we can kind of continue recording i'm pretty certain a good number will do because they've become very much self-led and and very, very, very independent and um, obviously uh, the habitats themselves we need people to make sure that they're being properly managed and um, and, and and looked after by the, by the landowners so that would be, be really useful. Um, Cambridge Acre as well is is working on a, um, a, a potential legacy scheme based around green prescribing where um, we might be uh, get some funding to um, 
uh, uh, you know, do some work at, at, linked to uh, Green's prescribing um, at, at a relatively early stage, so I'm not entirely sure what will happen for that. Cool. And, and there was that that follow up. Have you applied for continuation funds? So uh, the, the, the lottery tends to give you the three years, and and then fair enough, they have other issues to, and people to help as well. So that's quite 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 difficult. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Wonderful. Right. Okay. So we're now going to move on to Tony Winchester, uh, who's going to talk to us about why nature needs volunteers. Um, and, and I don't know if ever you read any local paper, you will find um, Tony either quoted or writing in there about um, the magical hares that can be found at uh, Walney and also about the, the wonder of feeding ducks and geese. And then uh, more recently, uh, kind of uh, just in conversation, I discovered he's also a, a stock checker at uh, Wick and Fen, uh, looking at the horses to make sure that they are um, all functioning very well. And uh, in Norfolk, we call that a looker. Um, so it's quite interesting. Here we just are rather dull. Um, so why does nature need volunteers? Um, Tony, over to you. Right, I'm going to kick off by trying to do a share screen. So let's see if it works. Um, share. Uh, going a bit wrong might have to i might have to ask you helen nearly had it then and um then helen do you think away. i could rely on your skills i think you need to stop sharing now tony so if you can press okay. the stop sharing button yeah, if I can rely on Helen's skills, then. I'm sure you can. Many. Helen? Yeah, she's doing it. Very good. Um, There's always a bit of a lag. Yeah. Whilst, whilst we're trying to get this together, I started off by saying to both Pamela and Helen that my IT skills were probably as fearful as those of the skipper of the Titanic to Iceberg. So I'm glad how I sent Helen the... Uh, um, any any joy? It was there and then it disappeared. And you're <coughs> yes. Yeah. Right. We're away. Um, in a moment of insanity, uh, I engaged in with conversation with Helen after I'd been given a swan feed. And she persuaded me that it might be sensible to give a talk on volunteering. <laughs> and uh, that's what I'm going to do. My background is not nature. My background is commercial. Uh, I was in banking and then ran a business. And 10 years ago, I had no business and sat watching Homes Under the Hammer for a week and went insane, decided that I really needed to do something. And my wife, in her wisdom, put me in touch with the WWT, the Wildfire and Wetland Trust. And I started volunteering for them 10 years ago. And contemporaneously, I started volunteering for the National Trust at Wick and Fen. For both of them, I've been doing this for 10 years. So you could say I've been volunteering for 20 years. Um, next screen, please. Slide, please, Helen. I think what, you're, what I'm seeing is not what you're seeing. So, um, I've, got, I've just got I've just got hands up in the air at the moment. Yeah, and I'm on my computer. I've actually got um, uh, the earlier Frog Life presentation, so it's a technical issue. I think. Hang on. I can see the volunteering um, screen. Yeah, but we can't see it in slide mode. I can't can see, see it. My. Let me see if I can do this again. One sec. Sorry about this. I think it's still well, there's still a previous. <clears throat> if I can carry on then whilst talking. Yep. Um, the bottom line for me is the word volunteering, which I'll mention regularly. Um, it comes from the Latin voluntarius, which means willing. And volunteers should be and are willing to carry out whatever tasks they are faced with. And in my role over the last 10 years with each organization, I've done everything from collecting horses poo to driving tractors, from feeding swans to 
um, giving talks to third parties. I go out and volunteer and give talks all, literally all over East Anglia. And usually the IT works really well. Um, <laughs> so unfortunately on this occasion, it's not gonna work very well. Oh, we're getting somewhere. I think this is going, we're there. Right, this is an example of me on the left-hand side giving a swamp feed talk at Welney. And on the right, sitting in the back of a vehicle, having spent some time using a strimmer and all these tasks I've done willingly and every volunteer, whatever task they do, I think we'll all agree it's got to be willing. So let's move on, please. The next slide. So benefits to the organization. Now, we'll notice in inverted commas, the word cheap under labor. But I think if those that run organizations were ever to factor back, even based on a minimum wage, the cost of paying for volunteers, many of the wonderful charities that do rely on volunteers would not be able to survive. So that's an accepted uh, norm. Enthusiasm. Obviously, all the volunteers come with enthusiasm and they bring a joy to their work, which many of them wouldn't have were they sitting behind a desk in an office somewhere. Reliability, they can be relied upon, they are prepared to commit, and they bring with them knowledge. Now, this is something that perhaps is overlooked often when you recruit new volunteers, because knowledge is gained through life. And most volunteers come from different backgrounds to those that they find themselves volunteering within. And therefore they bring commercial skills, staff management skills, all these sorts of skills and experiences are something that I often think the organizations don't actually tap into because what they do is they move that person into a situation that is new and interesting. But let's be fair, most volunteers bring knowledge and experience. Next slide, please. There are disadvantages. Um, take myself, um, reliability and priorities. When I started volunteering 10 years ago, our daughter who lives locally uh, was in the early uh, realms of marriage. She now has two small children. So our priorities have changed, our reliability has changed because we'll be asked to go and babysit. Um, and things like that happen as life changes. I've particularly put down here corporate policy. Most volunteers, I believe, have an affinity to the reserve, the structure, where they are volunteering. Most large organizations such as the National Trust and the WWT have national corporate policies. And sometimes the two don't go hand in hand. There have been examples historically which have made the national press where corporate policy of say the National Trust hasn't been met with approval by all volunteers. So I think that's something that is a disadvantage to the organization and that good old health and safety. Um, recently, I was told that within the civil service now, there's a risk assessment for the use of a kettle. Um, now this may seem far-fetched, but no doubt somebody somewhere has scalded themselves when using a kettle. So therefore it's prudent to have a risk assessment. But when you drill down into risk assessments, most of them are common sense. In other words, when you're out, for example, rounding up or catching horses, it's prudent not to stand before the, sed the dart that sedates the horse and the horse. Um, and I always remember reading the risk assessment, worst case scenario, death. Well, I think we'll all agree that we'll try and avoid that. So, Health and safety is important. It's vital that all participants, volunteers and staff buy into it, but sometimes it does appear to me to be a little bit over the top. Right, 
Next slide, and this is the advantages for the individual. And this is really what I want to concentrate on. Um, that's me feeding swans. Now, who wouldn't look at that picture and go, wow, what an image. You cannot be unhappy doing that. And mental well-being, I think, summarizes how we all feel. It makes us feel good working in this sort of an environment that's in wetlands. OK, so there'll be days when I'm out checking horses in the snow and the pouring rain. But even so, there's something about it that just makes me feel good. And I think that's what, as a volunteer, one of the benefits I get. Knowledge. I flapped around with this, a plain sheet of paper, because that was pretty much my knowledge when I started off. Um, now I can talk with great confidence about swans, about hares, about dragonflies, about those little brown jobs, about cuckoos, about climate awareness. None of this knowledge I had 10 years ago. And yet, thanks to volunteering, I've been the beneficiary. And I think when recruiting volunteers, this is something that we should talk about a great deal. Physicality. Um, I'm 76 this year, and I am absolutely and totally convinced that by having volunteered for the last 10 years, it's kept me mentally and physically well. Um, Last week, I do a Fitbit steps. They tell me I walked 71.5 kilometers. Most of that was checking horses and cows. Um, wonderful way to spend one's morning. Community. You volunteer for the community. You volunteer and you provide joy to third parties. I think it's so important link it in with teamwork, part of a team. I'm part of the Wiccan team and I'm part of the Wellney team. Um, and that goes back to what I say about an affinity to the area within, within which you volunteer. I'm very lucky. Uh, I represent both the National Trust and the WWT outside. I find that I got a request to give a talk next year in the autumn. And my reply was, be delighted to assist if still alive. It's fascinating that I'm getting demands 12, 18 months ahead. Um, but the joy for me, and I'm a person that thrives on self-recognition, the joy for me, I'll be walking down Ely High Street and somebody will come up to me and say, oh, you gave a swan feed the other day. And I actually love that. It's a lovely sensation. So that's what volunteering has given me. The routine of getting up in the morning. It is so easy when you are retired to become a sloth. Um, although, as I said earlier, watching Homes Under the Hammer has a limited time frame. So being a volunteer gives me routine. Training. You now know how old I am. Three months ago, I went on a four by four course. Now, 75, 76 years old, and I'm learning how to drive a four by four. It's skills like this. I've got my tickets for tractor driving, for driving four by fours, for brush cutting, for strimming, for grinding equipment. Hang on a minute, I'm an ex bank manager. This is bonkers, but this is what happens when you volunteer for an organization that believes in training. So wonderful new skills. Climate awareness. Now, look, you know, I'm not like you guys. I'm just a normal volunteer with now a reasonable knowledge of, of nature. But I am very aware of climate awareness, of climate, what's going on. And I've got a mantra when I give my talks, I say to the audience, you turn on the tap and you get water. Supposing you didn't get any. And I think it's things like that that bring home what's going on around us that really and truthfully 
has accelerated so rapidly. And I think, and a comment was made by one of the earlier speakers, I think that there is generally a greater awareness now of what's going on. So that's another positive issue. And as for rewards, the joy of volunteering is my biggest reward. I look forward to going to Welney. I look forward to going to Wiccan. Um, so there are numerous rewards in different shapes and sizes that come when you volunteer. Next slide, please. The downsides. Um, I would call myself a willing volunteer. And perhaps, according to my wife, I'm perhaps on occasions too willing. So a request comes in from Wiccan or Welney, can you do A, B and C? And nine times out of 10, I say yes. And I think that's recognized by both organizations. Sometimes caution needs to be exercised. Certainly in my time at both, we have lost volunteers where they were, for want of a better expression, put upon, used too much. And I think that needs to be considered. Age, Ugh. so many times recently, my brain says I can do something and the next morning my body says, no, you can't. And I think you have to recognize that. And I'm delighted to say both organizations have accepted that perhaps now I don't work all day chopping down trees. Maybe I just work for the morning and it's reasonable and accepted. I've already mentioned about family and how that can impact with your life as you're volunteering. And finally, and, and I think importantly, cost. I'm comfortably off, but I'm sure there are volunteers at the moment who can't afford to volunteer, particularly if where they volunteer are far off places. So perhaps the organizations need to consider the plight of the volunteer in those respects. Next slide, please. I was asked to give some indication of uh, the effect on volunteering in wetlands. And I just dug up a few statistics from the WWT. Now, all their 10 sites are obviously wetlands, so this is significant. So we've got just over 900 volunteers over the 10 sites, of which the majority by a mile are over 56. Now I say 56 because 55 has become a new retirement age. Um, worryingly, and I mean this, 13% are under 25. And I think both organizations should work harder at recruiting younger volunteers. I appreciate all the bricks that are in front of them, the walls that prevent young volunteers from working, but somehow or other we must get round that and not rely so much on retirees. Next slide, please. And this really was the biggest eye opener. Over 40% are involved in what you would call customer facing, i.e. making sure that the visitor is happy. And I've got a figure of 278 involved in maintaining reserves. Now, uh, if you were to drill down into that figure of 278, the actual number that are physically working on the reserves would be probably less than 10%. So out of 100% of volunteers, less than 10% are involved in maintaining the actual reserves itself. Um, that's quite fascinating because you take a site like Wiccan Fen, 10,000, sorry, 2,000 acres, looked after by a small core of staff and a pool of volunteers, they're really perhaps isn't a enough volunteers to maintain it to the standards that the National Trust would want. Um, it's a debating point, that one. Um, now, finally, last slide. 
please. The first line, self-explanatory. Volunteers have a critical role in sustaining those organizations. I think we all accept that. Um, and what Helen doesn't know is I actually changed this last slide, which had I've done my work properly, you would have seen, because I've emphasized here the fact that you should be increasing uh, recruiting new volunteers, but I've also put in a piece about youngsters that I feel it critical. The more I dug into these figures, that we look at um, recruiting younger volunteers as best we can. So there we are, a quick window of my thoughts on volunteering. And can I emphasize to all the audience, they're my thoughts, they're not the WWT's thoughts, they're not the National Trust thoughts. And I notice Emma is there and if she allows me back on Monday week, I'll be very pleased. So thank you very much for listening. Any questions? Fabulous, thank you, Tony. Uh, Jess, uh, uh, an amazing tour through and lovely to see the stats as well. We had very similar stats at Norfolk Wildlife Trust, you know, 30% of our work was potentially added to by volunteers. So very, very similar across conservation organizations. So does anyone have any questions for um, Tony? You obviously so comprehensively covered the subject, um, but I have to say, I do join you in the joy of, um, of volunteering in nature, even though I do nature for my job. Um, it is a rather wonderful thing. Um, so thank you for all the work that you do. Right, so I think if there are no questions and I haven't seen anyone's hands, um, I'm sure you can always find Tony out uh, at <laughs> Wiccan or out at Welney. I'll hand over to uh, Philip Marks, who is a uh, relatively newly joined Natural England uh, as part of a, a wave of um, species reintroduction and recovery officers that are based in a local team. Um, he's going to tell us a little bit about this and to summarise. So over, over to you, Phil. Uh, yeah, good uh, Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for having me along. Uh, like Pamela uh, just said, uh, my name's Phil Marks and I work in uh, Natural England on species reductions and uh, reintroductions and recovery, uh, which is an incredibly exciting uh, job title. Um, been really interesting to hear what everybody's uh, been talking about today. Species are critical and um, they can create, modify and manage habitat impacting uh, species richness, abundance, and habitat heterogeneity. Also linking in what's, what's been a, a theme that I've actually picked up and in my notes, I've been scrolling rapidly along as people have been talking, um, mental wellbeing and connecting people with nature. I think species is a, is a, is a key and tool in, in that, you know, our iconic species, how can we you know, get people involved in nature? And then how also, when we're working with those species, can we, incorporate other species, make it a multi-species project, thinking multi-taxa as, as well. Um, species recovery program, uh, one of the uh, many programs that I, I get to, to work with within the area team uh, and in Cambridgeshire as well, is, is been going for 30 odd years. Uh, it's set up in the 1990s. It's worked with thousands of different species here in the UK. Um, the delivering bespoke conservation measures it's been working with our priority species named in section 41 of the uh, NERC Act. It's been uh, working with those that are classified as extinct in the wild, regionally extinct, threatened, uh, those that are critically endangered or endangered or vulnerable uh, as listed on the GB red lists as well. Uh, that has also been working originally off of the Wildlife and Countryside Act all the way back in 1981. The programme this year has been split into two parts. The first is what we call our memorandums of agreement. That's what's been running uh, since the, the 90s. Uh, that's sort of set up between uh, Natural England and partner organisations, um, delivering shared, shared project objectives, mostly around research and development of conservation measures. The second is the new capital grant scheme, uh, which has just been released this year. And that is delivering on uh, latter stages of the species recovery curve, which I shall cover in just a, a moment. So memorandum of agreement, MOAs. So like I say, it's mostly focused there on research and development, finding novel new methods or creative ideas and solutions, questioning what is uncertain and making new uh, 
measures that can be transferred or reproduced in other locations. The MOAs have been uh, integral in setting up some of our uh, species strategies as we move towards species focus and on setting a, a design, a uniform design across the nation for delivering individual species conservation. That's the species recovery curve that I just mentioned a moment ago. Um, the MOAs work on sections three through to six mostly. So that's, you know, you're looking, understanding a species ecology, understanding what actions might work and how that might work, trialing those solutions for recovery. The capital grant scheme works on sections seven and eight. So best approach adopted and species recovering, which is where we're aiming to head towards that final section, section number nine, sustainable management. The capital grant scheme for this year has just closed. It's, we're looking at a possible seven applications uh, across sort of Cambridgeshire. Well, what will be successful, I don't know. Uh, I'm looking forward to finding out in July what those species that we'll be working on over the next two years will be. Uh, it works by funding capital works on privately uh, owned or publicly owned land um, in which the recipient has management control. It also can work on government land as well, including our national nature reserves, um, but we as Natural England can't apply for that fund. So we work alongside other organisations to deliver that species specific conservation bespoke work. So projects must focus on actions uh, for priority and those threatened species that are listed in our Environment Act and head towards those targets. So it's part of the Environment Act, the Environment Improvement Plans. How can we increase abundance of a species that, that we're working on? Can this project deliver increase in an area? Is it locally rare? How can we drive that species uh, to up its recovery curve back towards that section number nine? sustainable management. Those grants are going to be between 50 and 500,000 pounds and that will be running from this year uh, come July all the way through to the July of 2025 as well. So the sort of things uh, that the capital grant can do, this is not an exhaustive list, um, habitat enhancement or creation work, purchase and installation of new infrastructure, surveys and uh, after after surveys to, to check that the the actual uh, work has 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 delivered what it's meant to purchase of equipment we could be working on conservation translocation so I have very quickly scrolled the words large marsh grasshopper um, that uh, Pamela mentioned at the beginning because that sounds a very pretty exciting uh, project that would would fit within this sort of frame of, of funding as well. And um, like I say, it's just, it's, it's, it's new for this year and it's delivering species bespoke conservation, driving those along their, their recovery curve. Historically in, in Cambridgeshire, I've had a, a look back over the 30 years of, of the, the recovery program and, and what it's delivered and the list is endless, but some of the things that jumped out for Cambridgeshire came along as waterfowl, uh, white spotted pinion, early uh, gentian, dormouse, the, the pool frog, um, which James mentioned as, as well there. That's been funded with seven individual research projects dating back as early as 1997. And uh, we've got sort of the milk parsley, fen violet, orchids. Uh, as well that are all listed as uh, species that have been worked on by the recovery program historically within Cambridgeshire. Now, this, like I said, the species recovery program capital grant has, has already closed for this year. We're hoping for another round in the future soon, uh, when that will come and how that will look is, is still in, in the air. Uh, with most government funds, it's, it's an annual basis for this it's been running it's going to be running for the two years uh, on that one fund at the moment there are other uh, work streams with natural england as well and um, again 
this is by no means an exhaustive list of, of funds available. This is just some of the ones that I have had the, the joys of working with in the past and look forward to working with in the future. So species recovery programme, countryside stewardship that's been delivering um, previously as part of the environmental um, level, uh, environment level schemes and higher level schemes. Now countryside stewardship soon to be part of the ELMS environmental land management schemes going forwards. That split down below is sustainable farming incentive, countryside stewardship plus and landscape recovery. All of those are delivering either generic environmental uh, benefit or you can make it bespoke towards species. So countryside stewardship at the moment has uh, an option called SP9. That's the threatened species supplement. It's available in both tiers of the scheme, so higher tier and the mid tier. That can deliver bespoke work for a species. So if we take turtle dove, for example, um, as that was also mentioned uh, earlier in one of the talks, we can use a supplementary feeding option under, the, under countryside stewardship, which feeds during the winter. But instead, by using SP9 on a site that we know we have turtle doves, we can change the, the type of seed mix and also the time of year in which that is delivered. So you're driving um, sort of feeding food resources uh, for, for turtle doves also enables you to create ponds, uh, so water sources again for turtle doves. And then we've got wood pasture and wood pasture management as well. Uh, another great option there for nesting habitat for turtle doves. Um, one of the things that Emma mentioned as well with uh, the barn owls was the barn owl boxes and creating that, that nesting habitat where we are, we are losing yeah, those barns and and uh, veteran trees in the in the landscape. Uh, one of the things that countryside stewardship can also fund there is uh, WB one, two, and three, which is a different series of wildlife boxes. So different sizes there, uh, delivering for species across the the, the nation. Uh, other other things we've got coming up, landscape recovery, we're going into our second round now, delivering projects, 500 to 5,000 hectare large scale projects. Uh, that's particularly exciting um, work, recreating, uh, linking rivers back into to farmlands across vast areas of, of land and really driving species benefit is, is part of that as, as well. One of the other things, just quickly, facilitation fund, um, bringing farmers, foresters and other land managers together by funding uh, a facilitator to, to drive those conversations. And that's an excellent space for farmers to talk about how they can you know, join their habitats, upgrade connectivity, share knowledge, what's failed, what works. Also talking about species that they, that they can see, species that are on their land and how you can spread that across the landscape as well. Something also relevant, very relevant for, for Cambridgeshire, the Nature for Climate Peatland grant scheme. Uh, I know Catherine Waitman from Natural England, who some of you will know, uh, has been very, very active with that particular grant. So like I say, species are uh, the building blocks of a healthy and resilient ecosystem on which we depend for our well-being, food, security and prosperity. Not only do species manage habitats, create habitats, modify habitats, but from ourselves, we are reliant on those ecosystem services for our own mental well-being, for our own, like I say, food security, and for our our, our prosperity as we we go forward. We've seen that reduction in species. We've seen that decline and the damage that is doing. And through different funding streams, we're hoping to work on those different targets that have been set by government, the Environmental Improvement Act, the 25 year environment plan and the Environment Act of 2021. And then also the global agreements, the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, that's just closed not that long ago in, in Montreal. Um, those targets of species abundance, driving species recovery is, is crucial for, for enabling us to actually deliver on the ground those is exciting projects. Um, most of my work is, is going to be on those recovery. I'm also particularly excited by the reintroductions 
part of that that job description so if you have ideas you have locally led projects you you want to to look at uh, translocations, reintroductions, or you have uh, priority species in your patch that you are looking at ways to, to support, please do drop me a line. I'll be really interested to hear what's going on in your local area. One of the really important things is connecting people with nature. These projects, these, these species specific projects have that focal point that can connect the local community with their local natural, natural resources those local species, those you know, key iconic species. And I hope some of those pictures there give a list of, give an idea of, of some of the ideas and some of the projects that we are working on. Brilliant. Thank, thank you so much, Phil. Thank you. And I'd like to thank all of our speakers today. Um, it's been a fabulous run through. Kevin's iconic species, Emma's barn owls, James's frogs and toads, Howard's species monitoring and community, and Tony's nature and volunteers and this fabulous summary of all of the funding options and the focus from our statutory uh, nature conservation agency i, have to say, I re re reintroduced water bowls uh, in in an area in london last year and there's almost nothing more magical apart of course from large marsh grasshoppers and um, so i'd just like to thank you all uh, for coming i'd like to thank peter for as ever putting together this fabulous program of, of uh, diverse and fascinating elements i'd like to thank helen for uh, ensuring that everybody's presentations could be seen and that everyone was uh, communicated with uh, and just all of you. So uh, thank you all very much. And I think we'll close now. <laughs>